David Melville, my friend David, I first saw uh, performing Charles Dickens many, many years ago in Christmas Carol, and I think I have seen it seven or eight times, and it's been brought here now several times, and then I became a fan of the independent Shakespeare Company, which David and his wife, Melissa, run, and this afternoon, David will be playing the title role in Julius Caesar, a production that he and Melissa co-directed, and it is at their Atwater studio through May 11th. Uh, please see it. And, um, and then let's talk, we're going to talk right now about Shakespeare and Christianity, and David and I have divided up our different realms of expertise. I am going to do everything that's glib and derivative. He will do everything that is wise and original. So you're, um, you're taking all the fun stuff. Uh, that's, that's right. <laughs> I have more license. Um, so, as Laura was mentioning, it's kind of a coincidence on the calendar that after Holy Week, in which Christians commemorate the resurrection, death, and life of Jesus of Nazareth, there are these very vital dates in the life of William Shakespeare. He was baptized on April 26, 1564, and he was buried 52 years later to the day from which scholars calculate that he was born and died on April 23rd, a Taurus. Uh, like Jesus, few facts are known about him, and also like Jesus, the words by which he endures were set down not by himself, but by devoted disciples. And those words still shape our world in Shaw's Pygmalion. Professor Henry Higgins tells the flower seller who wishes to become a lady, he tells her, remember that you are a human being with a soul and the divine gift of articulate speech, and that your native language is the language of Shakespeare and Milton and the Bible. And Thomas Jefferson said, Shakespeare must be singled out by one who wishes to learn the full powers of the English language. I think that words are the pixels of consciousness and that if we learn to use enough of them properly, we may communicate like Jesus and Shakespeare in high definition. Uh, just before he left the White House, Barack Obama was asked what books had been touchstones for him during his eight years there, and he said, uh, I took this wonderful Shakespeare class in college where I just started to read the tragedies and dig into them, and that, I think, is foundational for me in understanding how certain patterns repeat themselves and play themselves out between human beings. So let's, David, use that as a starting point and talk about the foundations of, of Shakespeare's work, and maybe if you could tell us a little about the politics and the religion in Shakespeare's London. Right. Uh, well, Shakespeare was born into a world that was uh, uh, at a sort of uh, in flux in terms of uh, where it was in terms of religion. Um, I don't know. I mean, going back a little bit, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, uh, Henry VIII had some marital problems. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> He had to keep going to the Pope to get sorted out. And, uh, and to cut a long short story short, the, the solution ended up that, that he got excommunicated from the Catholic Church, which meant the entire country was excommunicated. And he said, well, that's, that's fine. I'll start my own church. Um, and uh, so the Britain, sort of, or England rather, uh, swung between being Protestant and then his daughter uh, 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 inherited the throne. And she was a Catholic, so he went back to being Catholic. Um, and she started persecuting the Protestants, and they would uh, um, uh, burn them at the stake, hang, draw, and quarter them, all those good things, um, for which she, she earned the epithet uh, Bloody Mary, um, which is now a drink with vodka and um, <laughs> tomato juice. <laughs> <laughs> or or, or if without the vodka, they call it a bloody shame in Britain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> 
digressing, I'm sorry. Uh, so, so she was a Catholic, and then, uh, uh, um, then uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, Henry VIII's other daughter, inherited the throne, and then it went back to being a Protestant country, and then they started persecuting Catholics. Um, so uh, it was going back and forth, and Shakespeare's family uh, were an old Catholic family from uh, Stratford-on-Avon. Um, so uh, Shakespeare's father, uh, we have good reason to believe what it was a practicing Catholic, and, and in Elizabeth's reign, they would have to practice uh, in secret. Um, and uh, people were punished and executed for, uh, 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 if they were found, uh, not just because they, they were against the Catholic faith, it was that the, there was um, a movement abroad. Uh, uh, England was uh, at war with Spain, or, or at least in conflict with Spain, and uh, they were, um, agitating Jesuit priests to, to infiltrate um, British society and um, uh, have secret congregations and, and plot the assassination of Queen Elizabeth, <laughs> for which one of Shakespeare's cousins was uh, caught and uh, beheaded. And as Shakespeare, maybe, maybe on his first entrance into London, we obviously don't know this for sure, but it's quite possible that he, he saw his, his cousin's head sticking on a spike. Um, as you entered London Bridge. London Bridge had a lot of houses on it, but the gate, uh, um, uh, they festooned with the, the heads of, of people who had been uh, beheaded. If you look at the, uh, uh, Google a picture of London Bridge and, 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 and from that period and zoom in, you can see there's a little drawing and it has these unfortunate little dots on it and their and, heads. And, and what I love about this is very often we think about times in history as being quaint and precious and dainty and rarefied, and they were actually bloody and brutal. And, and for a lot of people, when they woke up in the morning, they didn't know where the next meal was coming from, and they might have to steal something or kill somebody in order to eat to survive, and that's the world that Shakespeare's writing in. Could you talk for maybe just a second about what would it have been like to go to a play at Shakespeare's Globe Theater? Uh, yes. It, it... Well, let's put it like this. The, the, the modern globe, um, I don't know, maybe some of you have been to it. It's a, it's a reconstruction of the second globe that was built in 1599, so during Shakespeare's lifetime. The, and, and it's more or less, they believe, exactly to the same uh, dimensions. Currently, it holds 1,000 people. Um, but in Shakespeare's day, the same structure, uh, or say, same size structure, held 3,000 people. So they had a, a very different relationship with personal space back then. Um, it, it probably didn't smell too good. <laughs> uh, no, and that's why in all the literature from that time, they're always talking about perfumes because they're trying to mask the stench emanating from almost everybody you ran into. Yes, yes. People would hold little um, things perfumed with civet that they would uh, uh, hold up to their nose. And uh, I think, do they call them nosegays? Is that right? A nosegay, um, yes. Um, right, to try to block the smell of the people or cattle, or whatever, or the mud, the stench around you. Yes, when the, um, uh, if you went to the bathroom, well, there was a bathroom, but if you went to the bathroom at home, you were using a chamber pot, which then would be thrown out into the street when you were finished with it, um, which is why gentlemen walking down the street would uh, have the, the lady walking on the inside, uh, so that if the, the effluent came flying down from the window, it would hit the gentleman. Um, and, and it was polite to, to as, you, as you threw your chamber pot out of the window, to say, Garde Lou, uh, which was a, 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 um, a version of the French re regarde uh, below, I guess, and, and, and has become the word Lou, which we English still use. Ah, OK. <laughs> Let me transition. Uh, <laughs> I went, to, I, I went to see, and we did a talk back after Julius Caesar a week ago, and one of the things that I mentioned in our talk back there was that throughout Julius Caesar, which is obviously it's in Roman times, it's pre-Christian, pre um, they're all talking about duty and honor, and if anybody offends anybody, the, the person who perhaps created the offense offers to kill themselves. Everyone's volunteering suicide at every moment. And I wonder if you could talk about how that contrasts from, let's say, the Roman plays that Shakespeare wrote to then the, the Christian ones that he wrote were like in Hamlet. Um, 
Obviously, it's in the Christian era, and Hamlet is concerned that he not commit suicide because Scripture prohibits it. Yes, in the, in the Roman plays, there's not a whole lot of discussion about what's going to happen after uh, you've committed suicide to solve whatever political stalemate you might have. But that's it. what really is foremost in the mind of Hamlet. Exactly, yes. I mean, to be or not to be in many ways is about you know. And the very fact that you could, in a play, ask that question at that point in history is, is very interesting to me, because even 20 years before, uh, you might have been thrown into prison for, for, for questioning something like that. So, um, you know, the notion of what happens after death and the afterlife is something that Hamlet, uh, the play, explores and doesn't necessarily answer. Um, uh, but the, the play, it, also is a, is a kind of a conflict between the new world, the Protestant world of uh, uh, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth said she didn't want a window into men's souls. So she, she didn't necessarily want uh, to continue this persecution of other faiths. They could, she wanted them to coexist. It wasn't as easy as that. Um, but in Hamlet, um, you, you have a, a, a conflict between the old world, the old uh, Catholic faith of, uh, um, King Hamlet at the beginning has been murdered by his brother and, and Hamlet meets his ghost and the ghost tells him that he's in purgatory and he's being purged for his sins because he went to um, uh, he, he met his death before he'd uh, uh, and he has to walk submission. a certain length of time upon the earth just like Marley's ghost says in Christmas Carol yes, yes. it's almost the exact same line yes. and Shakespeare's writing this play uh, shortly after the death of his own son, who was called Hamnet, uh, you know, one, one letter different from Hamlet. Um, and uh, Shakespeare's family would have been forced to have a Protestant funeral, which would have been very quick and without the uh, Catholic ceremony. So in the DNA of this play, there's this, this struggle between uh, the, the, the old faith and the new faith. and, 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 and the superstitions, and, and then suicide, and how that's treated, and uh, Ophelia, uh, I don't know if you've read or seen this play, but uh, spoiler alert, she, she uh, commits suicide, um, and um, she's not allowed to be buried in the graveyard, she has to, or, or, no, she's buried, but without, without any ceremony. Right. Um, and that maybe is a reflection of Shakespeare thinking about how his son was buried without the ceremony that his family would have felt was necessary for uh, Hamlet to move on to the, the next place. And because you mentioned how um, inextricably intertwined politics and religion were, if you've got a monarch who is a Catholic or a monarch who is a Protestant and everybody's going to have to follow that, it's all wrapped up. Um, it, how, how does Shakespeare treat this notion that kings are divine or queens are divinely chosen? Um. Well, that's really fascinating because the history plays, that comes up quite a bit. Um, and the general sort of rule of thumb in Britain uh, is that the king is appointed by God somehow. Um, and, and if you follow the story of the plays, that's not necessarily true. They quite often appoint themselves. And, um, and, and, and in Richard II, Richard II is being besieged by people who want to take his crown away. But he thinks, since God appointed me, that can't happen. Yes. I will win, and he is wrong. Yes. Um, <laughs> do you, can I read a little yes. bit from Richard II? Yes, please do. Uh, so Richard II became king as a, as a, as a boy, basically, didn't he? Yes. Um, and, uh, which is always a bad start for British kings. Um, and, uh, and things didn't, don't go well, and his cousin is plotting to take over the throne, um, which... Uh, Richard and some of his advisors are saying can't happen because God has anointed you. So he's got this speech where um, I think he's, he's been forced out of the country for a bit, but he's come back with uh, uh, a certain amount of force to take back uh, the throne or, or at least meet his cousin. Um, but he's uh, arrived and, and is receiving the bad news that uh, all of his supporters are fleeing to the other side. Um, and, he, and then he says... Uh, um, to his cousin O'Merle. Discomfortable cousin, knowest thou not that when the searching eye of heaven is hid behind the globe that lights the lower world, 
Then thieves and robbers range abroad unseen in murders and in outrage boldly here. But when from under this terrestrial ball he fires the proud tops of the eastern pines and darts his light through every guilty hole, then murders, treasons, and detested sins, the cloak of night being plucked from off their backs, stand bare and naked, trembling at themselves. So when this thief, this traitor, Bolingbroke, who all this while hath reveled in the night, whilst we were wandering with the Antipodes, shall see us rising in our throne the east, his treasons will sit blushing in his face, not able to endure the sight of day, but self-affrighted tremble at his sin. Not all the water in the rough, rude sea can wash the balm off from an anointed king. So, um, and, he's and, pretty sure of, of his position. And he's completely wrong. <laughs> yes. And then someone comes in and tells him more soldiers have, uh, have vanished. And then, and then he sits there and says, that, that's it, let's just kill ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and what's that line he has when he's actually imprisoned? About time? Oh, uh, I wasted time, and now doth time waste me. Yeah. Let me mention two other things very quickly um, in, in the amount of time we have. One of the notions in which Shakespeare doesn't quote the Bible throughout his plays, but the themes reflect the arc of Christianity. And so one of the major themes is forgiveness, and there's also a sense in some of the plays of, of resurrection. Can you, can you talk maybe about some of the plays in which forgiveness plays a part? Yeah, I think, I mean, I personally, as a producer and director and actor, I think that forgiveness is one of the most powerful things you can put on, on stage. And it's, it's, you know, it's very moving to an audience. And um, in The Tempest at the end, um, Prospero, who's been this plotting. sorcerer yes. who controls this island, he's been banished, uh, and, and he's on this island where he controls everything with his magic. And he's been placed there by the machinations of his evil brother, right. and, and somehow after 20 years or so he's managed to finagle things so that the brother has washed up on the shore, and now he can exact his, his revenge, but at the end of the play he, uh, um, he forgives him. Um, and forgives uh, some of the other people who've been plotting against him. And similarly, in, in Measure for Measure, which is a really interesting play, because uh, you were saying, was it described as Old Testament? Versus well, well, the professor who taught Obama at Columbia also taught my younger brother, who would come home after one of the classes and tell me what he had learned. And one of his, that professor, his name was Edward Taylor, he just died a couple of years ago. One of his notions was that the basic plot of Measure for Measure is you have Vienna and everything's evil in Vienna and there is a good duke and a um, rules obe obeying, very strict, puritanical uh, underling that he has named Angelo. So the duke says he's going to leave and leave Angelo in charge. And Angelo begins to enforce all rules, rules as strictly as possible. There's no mercy. And then at the end, the Duke returns and brings mercy to everyone. And what Edward Taylor used to teach is that Angelo is, is the Old Testament, and that the Duke returning is Jesus bringing the concept of mercy and forgiveness. Yes, having played the Duke, I think the Duke does like to think of himself as Jesus. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> I, I... I don't know that uh, from others that people would actually sort of view him. He's like, it's, he's sort of thrown the world into chaos by, by disappearing and then sort of observes everything. He says, I, he claims that he's gone on holiday, but then dresses as a, as a friar. He's sort he of can... the Robert Mueller of his day. <laughs> in, the, in that we're expecting a more benevolent ruling, and then he kind of disappoints us if only Muller were to return at the end with a new ending. Right. Um, <laughs> but so, so, so Angelo is, is, is enforcing the, uh, the laws um, uh, against uh, having uh, uh, children out of wedlock and closing down all of the brothels. And, you know, this wouldn't have been entirely fictional to Shakespeare's audience because that was what, you know, the, the theatres were always threatened with being closed down by the Puritans. And all of the brothels that were uh, around the, the theatres on the South Bank, they called it the stews, 
which were all managed by the, uh, uh, the Bishop of Southwark. Um, he, he earned all the revenue from these, the, these houses of ill repute, um, uh, which gives you an idea of the dichotomy of, uh, of presenting the, 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 the existing church in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a kindly light sometimes. But um, so, uh, so Angelo is coming in and, and closing all of that down, and then, uh, 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 but then he's, he's, um, he's sentencing Claudio, Claudio to death because he's having a child out of wedlock. Um, and his sister, who's a novice nun, comes to um, uh, uh, plead for his life, and he says, well, I'll save him as long as you sleep with me, and, and, and there begins all the trouble. Um, uh, but the end of the play, to cut a long story short, um, uh, the Duke reveals himself, uh, and then throws the, uh, uh, the justice to uh, Isabella and uh, the novice nun and says, well, here is Angelo, uh, you get to decide. Does he, does, is he a victim of his own laws? Will he be put to death for this? Um, or do you want to choose something else? And she chooses forgiveness at the end of that play, which is um, uh, you know, really quite... And, and, and when you mention Puritanism, Puritans, I'm reminded of the H.L. Mencken definition of Puritanism as the haunting fear that someone somewhere might be happy. <laughs> and, and these people were a genuine nemesis to Shakespeare and did close down the theaters at different times. And so I think the first example of a Puritan in literature is the, 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 the villain, the um, figure Malvolio in Twelfth Night, which, by the way, the independent Shakespeare company is going to do this this summer. But talk for a little bit about Malvolio. Yes, well, so Malvolio is the, um, I think he's not the butler, but he's the, 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 the household manager of uh, uh, the Countess Olivia's uh, house and court. And um, she's, uh, her brother's just died, so she's in mourning. So he's managed to sort of take over. And the idea of Twelfth Night, Twelfth Night is the, the, the last f feasting day of the Christmas celebration that in Elizabethan times would have been celebrated um, by a, a reversal in households. So on, on Twelfth Night, the servants got to take over for the day and, and, and the masters would serve them. So everything's turned on its head. So that's a little bit of what's happening in, in Shakespeare's play. So Malvolio is, is, uh, uh, is kind of taken over and, and Sir Toby um, and... Uh, the, Sir Toby Belch. Sir Toby Belch. Who the, likes to drink. <laughs> and eat pickle herrings. Um, they, they, they go down into the basement and party. Um, so uh, Malvolio is kind of uh, taken over, and he wants to squash all of all of the fun. Just, uh, Sir Toby says to him in one of their confrontations, "Dost thou think that thou, because thou art virtuous, there will be no more cakes and ale?" Um, so he wants to stop the party, and um, and and he meets his come up, and they play a practical joke on him, and he's basically thrown into a, 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 a prison. jail. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and then there's also. There's also the theme of lack of forgiveness in Merchant of Venice uh, with Shylock. Um, and and maybe, we could, maybe we could conclude with, there, there is one speech, not about, not from Portia, not about Shylock, but about asking Shylock to be merciful. And, and maybe that is how we might conclude. Yes, so this is Portia's speech from, um Merchant of Venice. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. It is the mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show likes to gods when mercy seasons justice. And, and let me ask one more thing, which is um, the reason we did this scripture reading that Anna did so wonderfully today is when the King James Bible was published, Shakespeare was 46 years old. That Psalm 46 
If you look at it, the 46th word of Psalm 46 is shake. And the 46th word from the end is spear. So it's one of those details that leads people to think that either that Shakespeare was a collaborator on the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, and the fact that we know so few facts about him also leads some people to think that he was not the author of these plays that we've been enjoying for hundreds of years. Can you settle this mystery, Mr. Melville? I put it to you. Uh, well, I mean, I, there's, no, there's not one single piece of evidence that anyone other than Shakespeare wrote the work of Shakespeare. There's no fact, there's, no, there's nothing that anybody said or did in his lifetime and in several centuries afterwards that suggests anything other than he is the author of his, his own work. Uh, it all, I mean, it all comes from uh, a, a, a lie, a twisting of the truth um, that they say that Shakespeare wasn't educated enough to have written this work um, because he wouldn't have attended grammar school and uh, because there's no evidence he went to grammar school in Stratford-on-Avon. And this is true. There is no evidence that Shakespeare attended the grammar school in Stratford-on-Avon because there are no records that exist. So there's no evidence that anybody went to grammar school in Stratford-on-Avon <laughs> um, because the records don't exist. And uh, you know, They start at like 1610 or something like that. So, Taking that one fact and twisting it has become turned into a sort of parlor game for some people to say, well, if he didn't write it, then who did? Um, and now we have this industry where people like uh, the Earl of Oxford are put forward as a, uh, as a candidate who was, you know, he's, he's a published poet and his work isn't terribly good. He was most famous in his lifetime uh, for having broken wind in front of Queen Elizabeth. Um, <laughs> for which he was so embarrassed that he went on, uh, uh, he put himself in exile for two years. <laughs> Were that sense of shame uh, to be visited upon our current leaders? <laughs> and on that note, let us conclude David Melville and the Gershman. Thank you.